And he said, do you believe that God is sovereign over everything? I said, yes. Over evil? I said, yes. What did Joseph say? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So yes, God was sovereign even over his brothers attempting to kill him, throwing him, beat him up, throwing him in the pit, sold him into slavery. All of that Joseph saw was part of, was part of God's plan. So yes, he's sovereign over God's evil. Then he used this trick. Bob, am I a man of God? Now, if you're 18 years old, and the dean of the Bible college asks, am I a godly man? What are you going to say? <laughs> yes, say yes. And I'm a man of God. Do I preach the word of God? Yes. yes. By the spirit of God? Yes. Through the power of God? Yes, you have to be polite. He said, then how can I be wrong? Ah, gotcha. there's the trick. So then I did a turnaround and I said, no, wait a second. My pastor, Stephen Olford, believes in the pre-tribulational rapture. You are a post-tribulationist. You believe the church goes through the tribulation. You're both men of God who preach the word of God in the spirit of God, by the power of God, but one of you is wrong. You can't both be right. Both of you can be wrong. Just because you are a man of God does not mean what you're teaching is true. He said, well, then I see no reason to go any further with you. You are dismissed and they threw me out. Later, uh, the president of the next college I went to, President Barnes, tried the same trick. So the free willers will try the trick, am I a godly man? Then what I'm teaching is true. A godly man can teach heresy. An ungodly man can tell you the truth. What you are does not determine what you teach. The truth is to be decided objectively by is it in accordance with Scripture? So it doesn't matter that the person is nice or not nice. You can't fall for that argument. Uh, the Scriptures are very clear. Just as a leopard cannot change its spot, neither can a wicked person change for wickedness meaning naturally. God must initiate the process of salvation. As Jonah said, salvation is of the Lord. Uh, J.I. Packer, uh, Jim Packer, put it this way. What is Christianity? God saves sinners by himself. Monergism. God saves sinners by himself. All other religions, man saves himself through his own efforts. There's either man-centered religion in which you're going to win the approval and acceptance with God on the basis of what you do and what you are, mm -hmm. or biblical Christianity which says, God has given us through the merits of Christ alone. Through Him, we can be accepted to God. So we must be careful to maintain not only sola scriptura, but sola grace. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and leave the rest alone. Mm -hmm. There's no other works. Free will always led to a works-based salvation that's why the Reformation rejected the concept. I have a few different passages that are commonly brought up in attempts to defend free will. And uh, one is in Matthew uh, 23, 37, which uh, talks about Jerusalem. Uh, you're familiar with the passage. Oh, Jerusalem, yeah, most Jerusalem. people, uh, when they hear it preached, uh, it's all wrong. They said Jesus was weeping. And if you look at the chapter, nowhere says he was weeping. Matter of fact, he was denouncing uh, the scribes and the Pharisees. He was calling them names. He called them snakes, blind guides of the blind, hypocrites. Uh, he was really ripping into them. He was in the temple. The crowd was behind me. Yeah! Jesus was good. You're a blind guide of the blind. Yeah! Mm -hmm. Look at you. You're like a coffee cup, filthy on the inside, clean on the... Yeah! 
woe unto you. And one of his woes says that you yourself don't want to believe in me. And then you're doing everything you can to keep other people. So Jesus did not say, how often I would have gathered you, but you would not. There's no text, no translation that says, those who are your responsibility, those that are under you sitting in the pew, you not only don't want to believe with me, you're doing everything you can to stop people from believing in me. The Jerusalem in that passage is clearly a reference to the scribes and the Pharisees. Again, the free willers can't even quote the text right. There's nothing in there about free will. It's talking about people uh, who are resisting the gospel and getting other people to resist it. There is no tears over Jerusalem in the passage whatsoever. Is that uh, Would that draw f further clarification that since Christ incarnate in the flesh, limited in certain capacity, was merely talking in a physical sense, getting to the children to, you know, uh, minister unto them, not in the salvific sense that the Holy Spirit, they were preventing the Holy Spirit from getting to the children. That's not the issue there. Am I right? Yes, I'm, I was sitting, uh, was visiting some friends at Bob Jones, and in their chapel message, um, the speaker got up and said he was going to refute Calvinism. And I was amused. Here I was a Calvinist visiting some friends who were Calvinists at Bob Jones. Mm -hmm. And he did a nice little trick. He said, Calvinism teaches irresistible grace that you cannot resist the grace of God. How many of you resisted the grace of God for years? Yes, well, that's the end of that doctrine. They create these straw men that nobody teaches. Now, Acts 7, the Calvinist goes to Acts 7 to Stephen's speech where he says, you do always resist the grace of God. And says, because of total depravity, we are always resisting God's grace. It's the not resisting that takes the power of God. Mm -hmm. So we are all resisting the grace of God all of the time. When God intervenes and gives us a new heart, he resurrects us from spiritual death, and he gives us eyes to see, he opens up the blinded eyes, then we respond to the grace of God because mm -hmm. he's resurrected us, you who were dead and trespassed, and he resurrects us. And we would be naturally blind um, by Satan. He takes the blinders to open the eyes of those that were blind, was part of Paul's commission. He sets the captives free so that we respond to God's grace because God's grace has prepared us to respond. Mm -hmm. uh, he will make his people willing in the day of his power, as the psalmist said. See, so, yeah, you've got to understand, Scripture continually says, God must take the initiative. Romans 1, man does not seek after the true God. He only wants to make gods in his own image that will excuse him for his sin and rebellion. I want a small God, one that doesn't know the future, uh, one who can't determine the future, uh, the devil could win, God could lose, and these people think that that's a saving God. Mm -hmm. It's like if you went out to your car and turned it on, okay, put a brick on the, uh, the gas pedal, jumped out of your car, slamming the door, and it locked on the way out, you would have the car going down the highway, accelerating at high speed, with no one in the car. You go back to your home, and then the police come. Are you the owner of this Buick? Yeah. Uh, this car crashed into a farmer's market and killed seven people. We, we need you down. Wait a second. I did not know the future and that the car would roll down and kill seven people, so therefore I'm not responsible for the deaths of those seven people. Plus... All the windows and doors were locked in that car, and I was incapable of steering it. So therefore, I'm not responsible. Would a judge say that you were off the hook because you didn't know the future and because you were not capable of getting in the car and driving? No. Mm -hmm. So when these free will people say, well, God 
is not responsible for the evil because A, he didn't know it would happen. And he's incapable of changing anything. So the ignorance and inability of God will not excuse him any more than it would excuse you if your car went down and killed seven people. So to me, it's best to say God is God, man is man. Mm -hmm. He created the universe the way he wanted to. Gordon Clark was right. Gordon Clark, when I asked him, where would you begin on the sovereignty of God? He said, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning of it. Did he create the universe he wanted to create? Yes. Did he create it with eyes wide open? Yes. Did he prepare to deal with evil? Yeah, Christ slain in the mind of God before the world was created. God created a universe and prepared it ahead of time to be what he wanted it to be, including that God the Son, second person of the Trinity, would come and die for the elect. So, those who think by having an ignorant God and an impotent God gets mm -hmm. him away from the problem of evil, I think are very foolish. It doesn't at all. Yeah. Can you speak to the confusion that people have a lot of times with declarative statements or commands like, choose you this day whom you will serve, or uh, yes. there's a okay. multitude of them. They'll often say, well, doesn't the Bible... Yeah, I admit the, the word free will is not in the Hebrew or the Greek. Okay, I admit all of that, but the concept that man is responsible to make choices means that he must have the ability because God would never command us to do what we're not capable of doing. Well, of course, I usually say, where is that in the Bible? God, God commands us to be perfect. Nobody can be perfect. Mm -hmm. God commands all men everywhere to repent, but not all do repent, and not all can repent. But when you have commands, choose you this day, those are objectively true commands, but not subjectively indicating you have the ability to make that choice. For example, I have a dog, he's the Bichon Frise, he's 14 years old, Scotty. I could put a bowl of meat and a bowl of lettuce in front of that dog, and I will tell him choose you this day which bowl you're going to eat from. Now, by his nature, guess which bowl he will go to? The and meat. Burgers or loins. Yeah. The dog is a meat eater. He's carnivorous. He will always choose in accordance with what he is. Now, objectively, did I give him the choice between two things? Yeah. He chooses this. God offers to sinners the choice. Righteousness or sin? And they always choose sin because that's what we are. And so, yes, there are objectively the choices given, but we are incapable, says Scripture, of making the right choice because what we are determines what we do.